Um, now to another leg of discussion. Nigeria's former president, Olushe Gomba Sonjo, has emphasized the urgent need for Nigeria to bring into face uh, selfless and transformative leadership. He revealed this at an event organized to mark his 87th birthday in Abel Kuta this week. And the former president at that event also launched the Olushe Gomba Sonjo Leadership Institute an arm of uh, the Olushegun Obasanjo Presidential Library. He also launched a new book titled The Art of Leading, Unconventional Wisdom from the Bible. Now, Chief Obasanjo said bad leadership remained the biggest problem in Africa and called for the grooming of new leaders who are selfless and willing to sacrifice for the greater good of the continent. Now, joining us in the studio to talk about uh, this, so, so many talking points from uh, the former president's birthday celebrations. We have public affairs analyst with us in the studio, Biodun Shoumi, as well as the publisher, the publisher inside Watch Africa, Luashi Adeyemo. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank good you to so see much, you again. Good, you. good morning, good morning. Uh, Mr. Shoumi, and uh, good to see you both again this morning. All right, let's begin with... Um, the uh, birthday celebration of Chief Olusha Gombasanjo, as said earlier on, uh, anything the former president says always, you know, brings up a, a lot of reactions. And of late, he has been, um, you know, speaking about, you know, the state of the country during the elections. We saw how vocal he was and his birthday celebration. But first, in terms of his sense of duty, his kind of leadership, and you know, the legacy he brings on on board, even now, how will you describe it? Let, let, let me start with you, Mr. Shoum. Yeah, uh, President Obasanjo is a very interesting um, personality. One, he has twice preside, presided over this country, one as a military head of state and also as the president of the country. Mm -hmm. um, in both um, instances, uh, the juries are out on his legacies, you know, uh, because again, you always have this issue of big fortune um, tied to the president, uh, to the former president um, Obasanjo. Of course, he played um, a very controversial role in the last election, but um, by opting to support um, a particular candidate or a particular party, um, which many people thought probably uh, should have st simply stayed clear. Uh, but he chose to do that, and that is President Obasanjo. For you, he will never shy away from taking on any task um, as long as he believes in exactly what he's doing. Now, um, when you actually look at um, his views um, recently, you will realize that he's been, he has been trying to reposition himself as not only the moral conscience of the nation, but also the political compass you know, for the country and trying to fashion out a different uh, direction and also uh, different optics, you know, from uh, what his previous positions, which is well noted for. Um, Obasanjo is emerging from being a champion for Western liberal democracy now to what is now calling uh, homegrown or African democracy, that is a democracy um, imbued or that reflected the history, culture, traditions, you know, of Africa. And that is his new quest now, which he chose the opportunity of his birthday you know, to launch. He's also looking at the issues of uh, morality um, in politics, um, looking at the issue of leadership, how do you bring up new leadership. He seems to have lost hope in the present um, ruling class or political class, which he himself is a member of, you know, and that um, they have failed to transform um, the country. And um, he's moving away from... Um, well, he clearly said it that uh, uh, the, the present leadership seems to be transactional in nature. Uh, that is, the political class, which he himself is a member of, is transactional, and then looking for transformational leadership you know, that would um, also take account of um, uh, the fear of God, you know, imbuing you know, spiritualism mm -hmm. into one of the requirements for leadership skills. What he didn't clearly state is which of the religion is he basing his position on? Is it about um, his own origin, which is the African traditional religion, uh, Ifa or whatever, 
or is he talking about Christianity or Muslim? But if it, when well, I think he stated as much that, that you know, let's draw examples from the Bible. They are biblical leaders, and their virtues should will help uh, in our quest for better leadership in Nigeria. He did, right. but it's quite very ambivalent when you actually look at where he anchored it, okay. um, anchoring it on the idea that um, you know spiritualism, the way issues are resolved in Africa. Mm -hmm. Um, when people will sit at the village square, you know, to eventually settle, settle issue and ask you, oh yeah, um, you form a consensus and ask you, uh, they would um, place an obligation using right. traditional religion on you. That's where the ambivalence is from. Mm -hmm. While quoting the Bible, but is also suggesting something else through the town square uh, meeting. And we all know how issues are resolved within the African contest and everybody's bounded and said, okay, look, you have to uh, make a vow that you will not depart from this. And that's the whole idea when he's querying the idea that you can have a loyal opposition. That is, he is saying that you can't have a loyal opposition because within the Nigerian ethnics, you know, national ethnics, it's quite clear that opposition means enemy. And then he elaborated for that by saying even in Africa, opposition means enemy. And drew a comparison, you know, with... Um, um, with the Western monarchical system, you know, more or less saying that, look, our own understanding is totally, is diametrically opposed to the Western understanding of loyal opposition. Because we can still be in an opposition in the government because we are loyal to the monarchy. Whereas we don't have a monarchical system here. Even though you are opposed to the government, but you still be loyal to the monarchy, like the experience with Britain, whereas the story is totally different here, where is the winner takes all. And of course, he's, throwing, he's questioning the Western uh, liberal democracy as being practiced in the country currently. So in that context, he's trying to chart or project another direction, political direction for the country, by saying, look, you can take this, take out those things which are not African from it, right. and then build it you know, with African um, um, uh, culture, history, and contents. All right, let's uh, compare your take now with that of Mr. DMO. So what, what do you think about the former president's quest? Um, I'll just say that um, I'm really um, I'm glad at the way he's gone, you know, to elaborate this. I, I would want to sort of um, stay in the space of, so we have a former leader, like he like, rightly pointed out, who had in part of the failure of the past. Who is saying, mm -hmm. we failed, we didn't do it right, we can do it better. Can we start to chart a new course for ourselves? Can we start to do things in a better way? Because of the pivotal uh, position leadership occupies in the development of the people. Because you see, the truth of the matter is, rather than worry ourselves so much about how badly they did, somebody or one of them have come forward to clearly speak out and say there's a need for us to change the course of the way things were done. There's a need for us to start you know, a, a new way of doing things because clearly we have not gotten leadership right up until today. There's a need for us to do, start to do things in a new manner. And I think for me that is one thing I want us to draw out from there and start to say, okay, this man is suggesting something. What are the good that we can draw out of it so that that might be beneficial for us, not just in Nigeria, but in Africa? Because if you read you know, the thing he said you know, clearly, you'll discover that he was not just referring to Nigeria. As a leader in Africa, he kept you know, inferring to the fact that this sort of quotes across that generally in Africa, we seem not to be doing things right as regards leadership. And so in my own opinion, I think it's something we need to look at carefully and see the good that we can draw out of it so that we can run with that and for everyone's good. Because at the end of the day, all of us are clamoring for a better life. And if leadership obviously plays a pivotal role in achieving that, I think it's important that whoever is speaking you know, to us, we should listen to the person and be able to draw out the good from whatever the person is saying. All right. So you both are saying that okay, the former president, who is you know speaking about uh, the ideals in terms of governance and leadership, seems was part of the the system uh, or of the ruling class was part of the failures of, of leadership in the past. 
But um, in terms of how far you think this will go in his bid, uh, where do you see this all going? His um, birthday celebration drew, um, you know, a lot of, um, you know, big personalities within and outside the country, the likes of a, another former president, good luck, Jonathan, uh, the Ghanaian president, former Ghanaian president as well, and so many other... John Mahama. John, John Mahama. But wh where do you see this all going in, in the nearest future? How much good in terms of, you know, better leadership, um, and, and all of that, would it be better? Do you see it as being better if perhaps he had apologized for any roles he may have had in uh, the trends, uh, in the downward trends of Nigeria, for example? But generally, where do you see this all going? Um, yeah, if you go back as far back as uh, November 30 um, last year, uh, President Obasanjo made so much noise about um, saying the Nigerian leadership has failed, uh, African leadership has failed, you know, Africans, and it was quite very clear. And he has always been part and parcel of the leadership in Africa. Yes, he has been playing some other roles within the context of um, OAU, um, observer missions, you know, trying to uh, moderate other African leaders from who are in throes of um, um, political crisis. He's been trying to do that, um, not necessarily voluntarily, but because he's been encouraged to do that by the OAU. Okay, fine. But when you talk about the failure of leadership, it's not just about one regime. It's not even about Obasanjo. It's about the entire system which we are practicing in the country. When you look at the structure of Nigeria today, what do you expect? You're only going to end up moving from one crisis to the other. A situation where, you know, the 62.8%, the, the, the 52.68% um, of the responsibilities for governance, you know, has been entrusted to the federal. 52.68%. And then you have the state, 13 states, closer to the people, only with 26% of the resources to do that. So you have already it's an inbuilt um, system that would be conflictual. And we have also been seeing that in a way that it's only 11 states in Nigeria that can pay salaries without federal allocation. So, of course, there are a lot of issues which you have to look at. It's not just about leadership. Um, that is where I would probably differ, you know, from um, former President Obasanjo. When you focus on leadership alone, without looking at the system producing those leaders, you will only end up producing the same result all the time. So we, it's, we've gotten to a state where we have to begin to look at the system. The issue of state police is there because you cannot create a situation where you want um, good leaders, but you are bringing in you know, a, a police officer who is better known in Lagos, who knows the whole community, you post him to Kano, where he doesn't know anybody you know, to, to go and serve. So it's quite clear that that would undermine his performance, his effectiveness. Then we only end up blaming him. You talk about power, which thankfully um, the President Bolatin Mbu's administration has now been able to resolve. You know, you talk about power when you create state indolence by asking states who are generating power. Only about three states tried it then, that they should pump it into national greed. When they pump it into national greed, what then happens? The rest of the states will benefit from it. So there is nothing encouraging other states, you know, to go into power generation. So that is what I would call state indolence. So those are the kind of systems and structures that we need to break down. We need to move away from that. We need to make sure that the, 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 the exclusive list is actually pruned down in a way that gives the states, the states are closer, you know, to the people. When you talk about bad road, nobody thinks federal. You think your state governor. And we need to bring governance, you know, more closer to the people in terms of services they provide. And except to change the structure, you will never be able to do that. No matter the number of leadership you produce, uh, leaders with... Um, um, uh, uh, with conscience or with um, superior morality or whatever, you know, you will never be able to because those structural problems will continue to hinder their performance. Now, when we talk about, let me look at what um, President Vashon Joe also said about loyal um, opposition. opposition. Look, we have seen the Tinubu's administration trying to embrace that, but we all know that there's nothing called loyal opposition in Nigeria. The moment you try to join a government in national interest, you know, your party, the opposition party, immediately will view you as um, a collaborator or a saboteur or something. 
you know, and there's nothing called, the, that itself cannot work. The idea of winner takes all that we have in our politics cannot work. Because what basically it means is that those whose candidates were not elected will never be represented in government in terms of their views being had. You know, and that is why I will still embrace, you know, parliamentary system of government, you know, whereby you only get, if you win 50% of the vote, you have 50% representation in government. If you win 30%, you'll be, you still have 30% representation. So that those who voted for you, their, uh, their voices can be heard. You know, their demands can also be considered along with many other demands. So that is about the system. Mm. It's not just about leadership. It's not just about individuals. So there are issues. While I'm not dismissing what President Obasso just suggested, I'm saying that, look, even before you embark on that journey, you actually need to look at the system. That is the basis of our existence as a nation before you can begin to talk about leadership. Right. And at the birthday celebration of the former president, uh, Mr. Goodluck Jonathan, also a former Nigerian leader, also spoke about, um, you know, this concept of winner taking all. He also had a thing or two to say about uh, the state of governance in the country, even beginning with the elections. And uh, he said something about uh, a president must be accommodating to the extent that, you know, including members of the opposition uh, in his cabinet uh, as a way to ensure inclusivity. I, I wonder what you make of that. Where I'm exactly driving at is when you look at, like, just to compare what Mr. Shoumi said, if the Tinubu administration is on the right track or if it seems like it's still going to be business as usual, looking at the pervasive uh, system we have on our hands in terms of governance. Mr. Shoumi has been very clear by saying that we need to generally interrogate everything from A to Z, down upward, upward down. Because you see, no matter how good you are, and which is also compulsory, and I'd like to also take Mr. Shoumi back there. You see, for us to interrogate the system, you need a leader that is good to institute that. Because most of the time, you need someone to say, okay, we must go on this journey. This is critical. This is the way to go, and all of that. And when you talk about good leadership, you're talking about people with courage, People with the kind of character of the present president who will look at something in their face and say, look, this is what we're going to do and we must do it. And yes, it might be painful, we might go through pain, but this is the way we want to go. And so for me, I think we have a rare opportunity um, in him as he is courageous enough to say, okay, we do not need um, um, uh, the subsidy any longer. We, do, we cannot afford to go on uh, the regime of uh, the foreign exchange that we're going on. We need him to also exhibit that same courage in the space or area of rejigging the s political structure of Nigeria. Because clearly that is very, very important because you can't build a building on a faulty foundation. It is clear that what we're practicing right now and you see, again, I'm happy for this opportunity because I like to always take us back. So as we are right now, are we practicing the British uh, kind of uh, presidential or whatever government or the American? Because we seem not to be practicing neither of both. Because when we started on this journey, it was a British. And that was why we have the parliamentary kind of system. And s since that is what we're supposed to be mirroring um, a, a governance after, then we should go the old hog where you have the prime minister sitting in the house and the opposition can look at him in the face and say, look, Mr. Man, you're not doing this right. You see, those are critical things because you see, if you don't get it right at that point and do the right thing, we can keep dancing around and dancing around and dancing around. Those things will never take us to where we want to go. It's like boarding a bus you know, to a wrong destination and imagining in your heart that you're going to go to a destination that you desire. You must first know, where am I going? What bus can take me there? As it stands, we all can see clearly that the bus we're in, as regards the system of government, can definitely not take us to the destination that we desire. So I will want to use this opportunity to please appeal to Mr. President is shown courage, which is very critical in the character of a good leader, that whenever he believes in something, 
it goes ahead, not minding you know, what pain everyone is going to suffer and all of that because he's sure in his heart that in the medium or long term, it will be beneficial to all. Leadership, right. the system of leadership right now needs such courage. We need him to make such pronunciation. We need him to integrate it and lead us in that direction so that at least in this is time, we can correct that as well because it will, we will need that kind of structure or ca that kind of um, uh, uh, leadership system or political system to, to take us to where we all are desirous of going. But, but do you see you know, the place of this Afrocentric um, governance that Chief Obasanjo is also has been advocating for. Do, do you see a place for that in our present day democracy as against the, uh, the, the, the Eurocentric style of, of governance uh, that he says, um, you know, has brought us no good so far? I've always advocated for the fact that if you want to get anything done, you must put your feet on the ground. Now, anything you do, and it's not connected to your root and the way you think or the people you are, you're definitely not going very far. So we are gotten to a point in our life, we're old enough to start to say what exactly works for us the best. You know, so if we would continue to, because yes, I just suggested that we should mirror it after the British, but we should mirror it recognizing who we are and doing it to connect, you know, clearly and expressly speaking to your question, Yes, we need to inculcate our cultural, our um, uh, Afrocentric, uh, you know, history and bias into whatever we do. Because until then, we will not have our legs on the ground. And if you don't have your legs on the ground, I mean, one person that is my hero and I've read about over and over again is uh, Mahatma Gandhi. And that man is someone, he never became president. He was just a father of the nation. But you see, he believed in something and lived it, even the way he dressed. Because you see, those are critical elements that we always take our eyes away from. If we do not make up our minds, nobody's going to come from outside to do it for us as well as we can do it for ourselves from the inside. So it is time that as a people, as Africans, as Nigerians, to start to look inwards, to find a way of preferring our kind of solution of course, we'll benchmark it with the best practices in the world, what is working for other people, but we must be ready to introduce our own elements and the way we do things that clearly speaks to who we are because we have our own peculiarities. Uh, well, Vintage Olusha Gomba Sonjo also you know, spoke about uh, us learning, reaching out to Zimbabwe to, to learn lessons uh, from them in uh, how they tackled uh, inflation, uh, hyperinflation, in fact. Uh, in fact, statistics uh, say that as that was in 2003 uh, or there, but in 2008, a dollar was amounting to about 2.6 trillion uh, Zimbabwean dollars. Right now, it's hovering around 47.6% as against the Nigerian um, you know, inflation figures as of December 28.92. But uh, do you find any merits in, in, in that suggestion? Are the cases the, the same? Are there things that... Nigeria can, uh, you know, borrow from other countries, Zimbabwe in this context? I'm afraid I don't think we have anything to learn from Zimbabwe on how they have managed um, their crisis because they are still in the woods. They are not yet out of it. Um, when you look at um, the Nigeria and Zimbabwe, they are two miles, you know, thousands of miles apart in terms of the problems and challenges being faced by those uh, both countries. I would tell you, look at even the value of the dollar, you know, to, to Zimbabwean currency, you know, the gap is too wide. We are talking of trillions to change to dollars. That is not what we are talking about in Nigeria. It's just that we are so used, you know, to a subsidized existence in a way that the first major shock, you know, to go all the way to solve the problem when we realize that the system is being abused, round tripping is happening, people are taking oil out, you know, going to neighboring countries and then being subsidized is undermining our economy. You know, we have a group of elites who are determined, you know, to send oil to different parts. And you, 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 we all know what happened, how people get weapons through oil bunkering, you know, and then get weapons into the country, you know, in the Niger Delta. So there are a lot of good reasons why, you know, they have to deal with the issue of subsidy. 
And then with the subsidy removal, that only led 250%, you know, um, inflation, increase in cost of goods is 250%. It's not 2,000, 4,000 like in Zimbabwe. There are two different situations completely. Then again, when you look at the purchasing power of Nigerians, it is still today, it is still better than in Zimbabwe. The cost of goods and services are still better in Nigeria than many countries. Go to Kenya. You spend almost 200,000 naira to pay for electricity, just alone. How many people have that kind of money you know, in um, Kenya? Do they have a better economy than us? We need to look at the issues. This government came in at a point in time when the country's economy was prostrate. Totally prostrate. We are talking about printing 22 trillion under ways and means, which the CBN printed under with Temifile at the helm under Buhari. When you print money without producing anything to justify that money, what are you doing? You are driving up inflation. That is the cause of our problem. And that is why you see the CBN trying to mop money you know, out of circulation in different ways. That is exactly what they're trying to do. While it has its own effect of when you increase you know, the CR cash reserve ratio of the banks, it will reduce the amount of money you know, available to be spent. It's only about 25% of uh, depositors' funds you know, that banks can now loan out. So I know it has impacted, but it has also brought in revenue from other sources. For instance, the Treasury bills is now running at over 21% interest rate. So it's so attractive. And also government bonds. So you are likely going to have you know, the, the foreign exchange inflow into the country through that. And what is our major problem? Is it Naira or dollar? It's dollar. It's dollar that we need. For those who are saying, that, oh, we should have joined BRICS and all that, I understand that. But that is not a solution. If you join the BRICS today, join the BRICS today, you still have a dollar-denominated debt of over 87 trillion. The dollar component of it is over, it's about 32 billion dollars. Where are you going to get that from? Even when you trade from one national currency to the other. Where are you going to get that from? So whether you like it or not, you still need to clear the existing debt, which I think is what this government is doing right. They are trying to clear the debt, you know, which the country owes. They are trying to mop up the money, the excess cash liquidity, which is leading to um, high inflation, while at the same time looking at agriculture. Because look at it very well. What is our problem? It's not about Zimbabwe. We are better off uh, than Zimbabwe. What we need to do is take away Forex. If you take away, uh, sorry, PMS from Forex uh, table, you are taking away about $25 billion a year. Take away grains. You are taking away about $5 billion a year. That's about $30 billion pressure on our foreign reserves. And the government seems to be you addressing that. Yes, okay. in terms of importation, dollar that you require to import them. And the government is trying to address that. I think the Portacot refinery, maybe by the end of this month, you know, should be operational. We're expecting Kaduna to be operational by the end of um, uh, December. While at the same time, government is popping a lot of resources into agriculture. We only need to go back and learn from what Aulawa did um, in, in those days, which is each local government provide tractors for them. Farmers, look, to clear 100 acres of land now, depending on which part of the country you are in now, to clear 100 acres of land right. at the cost of 60,000 naira. Right. You know, you are, you are looking at 6 million. Where will a farmer get that 6 million? Yeah. First, just to clear. But we can put tractors in local government. We have still a, a factory in Bauchi, you know, producing tractors. Yes, it's been looted, but we can go back. The buildings are there. We keep them, you know, create employment, produce those tractors, put them in all the 774 local government, mm -hmm. still owned by federal government. Let the local government only pay for the staff. Let the farmers pay for the fuel you know, to the, the, the diesel, you know, to use them. And through that, we will be able to expand access to land. This can be negotiated with state government. There is no state that cannot produce 100,000 hectares of land. We have no business, you know, importing sardine into Nigeria. We have no business importing grains from anywhere. And I think the government is on the right path by focusing, you know, on the agricultural sector and trying to fix the refinery so that we can at least take away about $30 billion of pressure on our foreign reserves. Right. Mr. Deyemo, what are your thoughts on, um, you know, the efforts to bring Nigeria out of the woods 
uh, that, it, that it presently in amidst the former president's suggestions? I, I think we should just continue to expand on what he has just said. We need to drill down into the agricultural space. Right. And I'm happy that uh, the present administration is, you know, is already doing that. Truth of the matter is uh, we say it all the time, but it seems we don't even believe it, that uh, when there is food, when food is out of poverty, mm. poverty is gone. But we then see it and we then look in another direction. When you travel to Ekiti, Akure, and those parts of Nigeria, and you see the green, it's, it is a crime as a people that we are hungry. We shouldn't be. We should look for mechanized farming. And one of the ways is to, you know, do what uh, Mr. Shoumi has just said. Am I right? Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, you know, that we must make sure that all the local government area are encouraged to make sure. You know, even this uh, President Obasanjo was the one who talked about uh, Operation Feed the Nation. Maybe he needs to go and dust back his books and all of that. Because you see, for me, as much as possible, I really don't want to see the wrongs. I just want to see what are the okay. necessary things that we can draw from what he has said yeah. and how can we move forward. Then the refinery. Now, again, to add to what uh, Mr. Shomi have just said, I would also want us to interrogate these modular refineries that we've been talking about for a long time and which each time we look away from them. So we're looking at Kaduna, Port and the rest of them. But some people have been doing these things supposedly illegally. Something obviously is in that space. Can government look in that direction and see whether we can again find a way? Because you see, it's not about uh, profitization. It's about the fact that we're in a state right now that we cannot afford to import one uh, liter of oil any longer. So whatever we can do, to make sure that that is out of the way so that we can take the pressure. Because look, the problem we have can be solved. In, okay, don't let me over-exaggerate. Not in the short term, but in the middle term. What we have right now, if we do the right thing, food and uh, refining our fuel here, you'll be shocked at how things will just level out. Because those essentially are the major things we expend money on. And let Nigerians start to see that you don't really need... And again, I still wonder, why do we even import food when any time we travel out, the first thing you see Nigerians doing is looking for Nigerian uh, <laughs> restaurants all uh, over the uh, place. Delicacy. So in other words, we really love our food. Mm -hmm. yeah. you know, so let's right. produce it. So why are we, in, for what? For, say, for show or something? So let's stop wasting such money and make sure we invest the money in our food that is very sumptuous, that we all love and we go and look for all over the world, let us start to have it all over the place. Let us start to refine our fuel. And, and, but, and you'll be shocked that in the short term, okay, I don't want to say short, medium term, mm -hmm. so that we don't say, oh, the man said short term. In the very not too long distance, we'll see a turnaround from where we are right now. We need sincerity. We need courage that this administration has shown. It is impossible to, unless you just want to be, overly critical, to see the kind of team that Mr. President has got. You see, okay, let me refer to this. I'm sure a lot of people will not probably see those things that I saw. When you were look, they were, you know, playing the um, uh, barrier of uh, um, uh, Abat Wigwe. Now, if you see the connection of the team of Mr. President with the financial sector, with the things they were saying, they had personal relationship. Some of them even consult with them outside of official hours. In other words, you have a team that have their legs on ground and have relationship with the financial sector of this country. So it means that we have a team that can take this country out of this world. I don't know whether you get what I've just said. I mean, they come on the stage and tell us how much they have relationship with them. We agree how much, you know, personal relationship with all of those people that are driving this space, Dangote and the rest of them. So it means that we have a team that have a long-standing relationship with these people. And so we can't truly really trust them. All we need to do is to insist that, look, we know you can do it. Do it because you have all that it takes to take us out of this world. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is my own submission because I just feel that what we need to solve our problem is actually in our hands. Oh, yeah, all right. If, if you... But, uh, we, we have less than five minutes. Okay. I, I just want to, perhaps, if you can find a way to merge this what point you want, you to, want to make mm -hmm. with, mm -hmm. with uh, you know, what mm -hmm. I'm driving at, which is 
uh, the issue of leadership because the former president has also launched a leadership institute. He's talking about, you know, giving the youth uh, a, a bigger place, a more prominent role at the table. Uh, and then he said something which I want to ask you both. I hope we have time. Whether leadership can be taught, what to teach and how to teach in this uh, drive for better leadership. Okay. Yeah. Before answering your question, right. I just want to um, highlight the issue of the modular refinery, which um, has been highlighted here. Um, there are only there are 25 licensed modular refinery in the country today. Only five are operational. The problem is this: they need um, 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 crude oil, you know, in order to Same. go into full production. They have to buy the crude oil in dollars but they're only going to produce and sell in Naira. Yeah. That is the problem. And I think... We the, need to correct that. We, we need to correct that. Yeah. And I think that has been brought to the attention of the government. I'm sure the government may, must be looking into it in order to encourage other modular refineries to come into existence. And I think that problem is due to the shortage of... Um, uh, the uh, reduction in accrued oil production, which has now gone up from 800,000 800, barrels a day or inherited 1 million barrels a day by the Tudumbu administration, I think it's about 1.5, 1.6 you know, million barrels a day. Once we're able to meet our OPEC quota, I think we'll solve that problem. But like we all know, it's a gradual issue. It's not something you can decree and will happen overnight. Now, to your issue about whether leadership skills can be trained or acquired oh, yes. or taught, yeah. or through um, one way or the other, yeah, Mr. President, the former president has a right to set up the Leadership Institute. He has always been doing that. Don't forget, you have the African Leadership Forum, uh, which was in place, you know, uh, he, he, I think he created it either before he left office or when, just after he oh, left yeah. office, you know, and which is based in Ottawa. We've always been having that to make an input in, into how leadership behave. We have had other people, you know, trying to promote good leadership in Africa. But the fact of the matter is this. You must have your own set of core values. Today, I would ask, what are the Nigerian core values? What you have is core values of each ethnic nation. Do we really have a Nigerian core values around which you want to build that leadership? And particularly, when you have a structural problem which needs to be corrected to restructuring. If you don't do that, I agree. You need a visionary, a, visionary, a very courageous leader, and probably I would uh, concede that Tinubu ex exemplify, you know, that courage which you need, the vision which you need. But you need that kind of leadership to be able to drive in, you know, some of these issues, to provide the necessary basis, the necessary background where those leaders will emerge. Those leaders must emerge with some core values. Part of those core values include what President Obasanjo mentioned, which is morality which is, you know, to have a feeling for your fellow human being, you know, to ensure that you are not a selfish leader, to make sure that you have the appropriate knowledge and skills to be able to govern. But without the necessary, you know, um, um, structural base, it will become like gambling all the time. Mm -hmm. And that is why I'm impressed with the steps being taken to address different parts of this problem. It might not come overnight, but at least we are beginning to interrogate you know, the challenges we face in order to ensure that we are able to provide, you know, uh, produce good leaders, which will take us, you know, to um, El Dorado in future. On the level of ECOWAS, uh, for example, of course, the past few weeks has been, um, you know, very interesting. Uh, ECOWAS lifting sanctions on, um, you know, Niger and, uh, you know, following their decision. What are your final um, words in, in this? We don't have any time at all, but what are your final words in this regard, whether this better leadership can also be enhanced at the regional level? Absolutely, and I think all we just need to is to be you know, fair to ourselves. I mean, he just talked about core values. Let's write it on the board. You see, the problem is, you see, the core values, like you said, is just in sectoral. Yoruba people, Igbo people, and all that. Let us aggregate them and write them on the board. Let it be very clear. Let a toddler, let a youth, let an elder know what it is to do right. And everybody can see it. So when you're walking away from it, everybody will point to you. Because right now, the reason why we're able to do the things we're doing is because we're not even clear about what the right is 
or what the wrong is. And that also can be distilled or shared with our neighbors in the Equus subregion. Oluwase Adeyemo and of course Abiodun Shomi, I thank you both for your contributions on TVC Breakfast this morning. Thank uh, you for having me. Thank you thank again. You.